Hello, it's time for part 14 of Open Dog, the open source quadrupedal robot. Now there hasn't been an update for a while, since about part 13, and that's because I've been busy with quite a lot of other projects. At the end of last year I was building a real transformer that turns from a car into Bumblebee, and I've been doing a few little projects every week this year, and I've been waiting for a few things to happen so I can actually get on with Open Dog. And we'll talk about some of those things in this video, but the basic plan was to do lots of work in the background, and then publish a video, which is a kind of roundup video of all the changes, and then hopefully show it doing something significant instead of lots of little videos that aren't very interesting where I do some little changes every week and then not much happens. However, loads of people are complaining saying RIP Open Dog and stuff like that because there's been no update. So actually what I've decided to do is do it the other way around and do some videos still with some good information in to show what I'm doing on the development to try and get it working properly and hopefully that's interesting and people will stop complaining. So here's a little recap of the project for everyone who hasn't been watching since the very start. Open Dog is made with 3D printing and CNC aluminium parts I cut on my CNC machine and all of this was designed by me. The project is open source, all the Canon code is published in the link in the description below and it's on GitHub. The main motors are brushless motors, they're Turning G 149 kV motors, the 6374 SK3 range and those are driven by the O-Drive Robotics brushless motor driver. And there's 12 motors in the robot so there's six O-Drives. All of the electronics are currently Arduino based, but that's something we need to upgrade. And so far we've worked out a kinematic model and an inverse kinematic model so that I can position the joints in Cartesian coordinates. Basically I can put the feet in XYZ space and it works out what to do with the other 12 motors. Don't forget you can support the project and support my channel on Patreon and also buy Open Dog t-shirts in the link in the description below from my Teespring store. If you don't like Patreon, I also have YouTube channel membership, so just click on that join button below and you can get some exclusive rewards including early access to all my videos, a live stream with me, and sneak peeks and pictures. Well, it's a dog and it's got four legs, but can it walk? Well, we did some walking where we made a statically stable gait where it basically took one leg off the ground at a time. It was moving pretty slow. It does move faster than this, but this was sort of the initial thing to try and get it to locomote, which kind of works. I then added an inertial measurement unit and tried to make it more dynamic. So we tried to make it walk a bit like the Boston Dynamics robots where it takes opposite diagonal legs off the ground at the same time and tries to balance. Um, it didn't work too bad, but we have some conflicts where we've got motion smoothing and the inertial measurement unit and the PID controllers can't react quick enough to make it stable. This is mainly down to all of the electronics that are in here. So I've got multiple Arduino Mega 2650s, which are only 8-bit and they're running at 16 megahertz. And there's several of these linked to the O-Drives, and we'll talk about that detail in a minute. Then we've got one master one, which is actually running all of the kinematic model and so on. The inertial measurement unit's also separate and everything's strung together with serial and it's running pretty slowly. So basically what I need to do is restructure the electronics to make them faster, hopefully just have one master controller, and then we can run serial data much faster and have it react better, get the motion smoothing in before the correction for balance. So this is an Arduino Mega 2650. We've currently got three of those in Open Dog, and this is a Team C 3.6, which is much smaller. Now this one, as I say, is 8-bit and runs at 16 megahertz. The Team C is 32-bit and runs at around 180 megahertz. And it's got tons of I.O. on it. It's got better analog ins and all sorts of stuff like that. So this is uh, far superior and we can still program this as an Arduino. So what's stopping me just taking this, taking these three out and putting this in. So there's nothing really stopping me restructuring the code, putting it on the Team C. The Arduino Megas each have a number of serial ports. They've got four UARTs. So we've got one of those each talking to three O drives over serial. Then we've got a master Mega 2650, which is talking to the other two. And that's how it's structured. The Team C 3.6 has six UART serial ports so I can talk to all the O-Drives from one. So there's nothing actually stopping me replacing it. There's just one small issue that's going to become very annoying if I can't resolve it. So all of the motors on Open Dog drive these ball screws, and then there's a lever across a triangle, and we worked out all of the kinematic model for that. So basically it's a linear to rotary axis. But the linear axis needs to home and get its zero position. So every time we power up Open Dog, all of the axes home and they hit an end switch, the same as it does on a 3D printer, and then it basically remembers a zero position. And that takes place on the two Arduino Megas linked to the O drive. So those are essentially slaves that deal with that homing, wait for the switch to be pressed, and then they basically take off the difference in the encoder position from where it started. So we get a zero position. And those are remembered on those Arduinos as long as they stay powered up. And that means I can flash the code on the master Arduino Mega that feeds them data, and I can reboot it lots of times, and we never lose the zero position. So if I replace those three Arduinos with one master controller, it means every time I reboot it, it's going to forget its zero position. 
Now there are plans to have this written into the O drive firmware. So we actually have a GPIO on that and we have a homing sequence so that it would actually remember the zero position within the O drive. So as long as that's not rebooted, it would remember the zero position. And then basically I could reboot the master controller as many times as I like. We wouldn't have to recalibrate 12 joints every time we reflash that code, which could be quite a lot because I do quite a lot of things by trial and error, quite frankly. However, that hasn't been written into the firmware yet. It's pending, but it's not there yet. And that's one of the main things I've been waiting for. So I was thinking again about other robots, perhaps ones that don't have linear axis, perhaps if we just had a gearbox on the brushless motor and we use the O-Drive to control it and how we'd actually achieve that because there'd be nowhere to home it to unless we bent the legs, you know, back to their maximum position every time. So what ideally we need is some sort of system of absolute position feedback. And of course, homing the joints means putting it back on its wooden stand, which can be quite tricky because it's heavy. And of course, if it reboots in an unknown state, all the legs collapse, so it's a bit of a nightmare. So I don't really want to have to do that every time I flash the code in any case. A few weeks ago, I built this jumping robot leg. Um, so that would be in the same position as well, especially if it just had a brushless motor driving a gearbox to pull that bungee up. So we don't really want to have to put all the legs back down and try and get them there at the same time and have them conflict and all of that stuff. So we really do need some method of actually measuring an absolute position when we reboot that master controller. So ideally we need an absolute position device on every joint of the robot and there's three on each leg and of course 12 in total to match the motors. And then we can use those for one of two things. We could either close our own loops using PID or some other sort of feedback. So we're constantly trying to match the position against those feedback devices and we're just running the O-Drives in velocity mode instead of position mode so we can make that proportional we can use P, I and D in the PID controller to get a good response or we could just look at those feedback devices on power up so we know exactly what the position is and we could zero the encoders out from that using the master controller and we wouldn't have to go and home on the end switches every time and then every time the master controller reboots it would know exactly what the position of the legs is and we could just continue but we're not just going to tear open dog to pieces replace all the electronics and just put feedback on the joints and hope for the best we're going to do a test like we did in the early episodes before we built it and i'm going to use bits of broken exosuit leg which have been hanging around falling to pieces even more since the exosuit accident which you can check out in the exosuit build part 25 and we're going to use some bits and pieces off that another motor another o drive and the teensy a feedback pot and we're going to make a test rig and see how well it works so i've just got the ball screw assembly there out of the exosuit with this piece that slides up and down and i was going to use the whole exosuit leg to test this but i've actually decided to sort of rebuild the joint at this end with another piece that moves on there um, and put a pot on that and measure the position so i've got some bits and pieces i've printed just going to assemble this some other bits and pieces to tidy up and we'll see what we've got so here's my test rig we've got the motor here with the belt driving the ball screw we've still got the encoder which is needed for the o drive so it knows when to energize each phase of the motor and it can keep that in sync whether we use position mode or velocity control we still need that encoder this is an 8192 cpr encoder which means it's got 8192 counts per revolution uh, which is incredibly accurate so we've got a lever that moves the joint and we've got a feedback pot on here and this is just a 99p linear potentiometer i think it's 10 or 100k it's not an ideal thing to use i wouldn't use them on open dog but it'll do fine for testing and that just measures the actual angle of this joint with a little coupler in there um, there's no bearings it's just a piece of studding through plastic bolted onto the leg or whatever the joint is going to be here it's not an ideal arrangement it's just a test rig so if i was actually putting this on open dog of course we'd actually have the pot mounted properly this pot does about 270 to 300 degrees of rotation of course this leg only does about 90 and so do the open dog legs maybe slightly more so we'd be better off gearing it up to make the sure the pot turns its full rotation or putting a belt on it or something like that so we get better resolution also these pots are probably quite noisy so in an audio application that would mean it was quite scratchy which isn't great for getting data out of it and also these won't be very linear so um, there's no linear guarantee on these cheap pots which if we're trying to translate that into degrees of rotation we won't get very accurate answers so I'm going to use this for testing but it's not an ideal situation when we're trying to do a kinematic model so I've mounted up my O drive with the cabling the encoder cable and the power cables and the battery cable and we've got our teensy mounted on a bit of breadboard I've soldered some pin strip on uh, so that I can easily plug stuff in for prototyping so now we're going to run an analog in from this pot and also another pot which is the one we'll turn to set the position we want so we're going to turn this thing into a giant servo so up this end of course we've got um, all of these big power cables both the battery and then we've got the uh, three phase motor cables essentially these three wires that run the brushless motor and those are high power they could be up to 50 volts at 50 amps 
um, which means they could induce signals in the other cables. So the encoder cable, and this encoder and the cable came from the O-Drive Robotics website, this is screened cable. And I'm gonna do the same thing for the pots so that we don't get any dodgy signals. And that looks like this, which essentially has this braided screen that goes round the actual signal cables inside the insulator. And that braided screen is connected to ground at both ends and that should hopefully stop any dodgy interference. So of course on the actual open dog, all of the cables come down these conduits to the legs and all of the power and data and signal cables all run alongside each other. So screen cable is quite important. What we could do of course is put another smaller teensy in each leg, read the analog signals with very really short wires into the teensy and then send that data digitally, perhaps building an RS-485 network or CAN bus or something else on the actual robot and then we could basically use parity to make sure that data is okay if there's any interference on the digital signals. We could also of course partner a teensy with each O-Drive um, and then do the same thing then, but just build our own serial network. But then of course we could use those teensies to remember the end positions, the home positions of those encoders, and we wouldn't have to do any of this at all. But there's multiple ways to crack an egg without breaking the plate. So my analog pots are wired in, one is mounted just on this bit of breadboard with a sticky pad so that I can turn it, the other one of course is on the joint and we've used the screened cable. So I've got the uh, analog ground is this wire and 3.3 volts is this wire, comes with this uh, little map here that tells you what all the pinouts are and the other wires are the analog ins that go to the wiper. So the 3.3 in ground goes to either end of the pot and the wiper goes to the analog in of both of those pots. We could have, of course, um, grounded the pot body there by linking that to the screen as well. I haven't done so, I've just left it for now, uh, but that's what you should do. So uh, now we can read those analog ins and see if we get these values. These other wires here are the serial which go out to the O drive which is over there. So we can pretty much program the TNC exactly like an Arduino. This is the Arduino IDE. There's Arduino support for the TNC that you install and then basically it's pretty much the same. There's a couple of differences like the analog um, 0 and 1 are just called 0 and 1 instead of A1 and A0. But apart from that it's um, pretty much the same as programming an Arduino. It's just much faster than the 8-bit ones I normally use. And you can get faster Arduinos, of course, as well, which actually are made by Arduino. So all I'm doing is um, some code here to open the serial port. We're reading the two pot values and writing them out to the serial terminal, and we can see them there. And you'll notice what I've done here is an analog read resolution 13. Now the TNC has 13-bit analog ins, whereas a normal Arduino Mega or Uno or whatever only has 10 bits. So these values go all the way up to a maximum value of 8191. If it were 12 bit, it would be 4095. If it were 11 bit, it would be 2047. And 10 bit, of course, is only 1023. So uh, the pots are still, and you can see there's a bit of jitter there, but actually this is quite high resolution, so that jitter is quite insignificant. So now if I turn one of these pots, we should be able to see that value moving. So that goes all the way down to zero, and all the way up to 8191. And if we put it somewhere in the middle, it should be sort of pretty stable. So there we go. Um, if I wind the motor, of course, the other one should move. So you should be able to see that first column changing. So that's pretty good, but we haven't powered the O-Drive up yet. So let's power that up and put some of these wires close to the pots and see what the effect is and see if that value becomes less stable. So now I've powered up the O-Drive, we've just used the stock Arduino code, which basically will initialize the motor and do some motor tests. So now the motor's got holding power. I've calibrated that for 40 amps of holding power up from the default 10. So that's got quite a lot of holding power there to spring the thing back. And you should be able to see this pot still moving as I move the joint. So that's in the first column, of course, because I'm actually driving this. And the second one won't do anything and until I turn it, essentially. And you can see there's still just about the same amount of jitter. So hopefully that screen cable is working. But as a proper test, I'm going to go and get the actual motor wires, the three-phase wires, and kind of wrap them around here and the analog in. So they follow almost the same path as this uh, cable. So if the, mo the cable was unscreened, I'd expect that to induce massive spikes in it just sitting there because it is in fact holding the motor with three phase power. And as I turn the motor, we should see, um, if it were unscreened, we'd see even bigger spikes as it drives more current trying to hold the motor in position. But that looks pretty good. So I'm quite happy with that. We've still got a tiny bit of jitter. And of course, if we had a longer cable here, we might get more, um, but that seems not too bad for having screened cable. Um, so we've still got a bit of jitter, but how can we get rid of that? So what I've done now is basically remove some resolution. So I've done two map um, statements here, which basically reduce the 13-bit analog in down to 10 bits. So that's the same as we get out of an 8-bit Arduino. And now you can see that basically these numbers are pretty solid. There's the odd little bit of jitter, but it's nothing like we had before. So um, let's just turn that pot on the right there. 
should be to see that um, it's a pretty solid 10-bit number. So let's go and put those motor wires nearby as, again there. And we might find that as we drive this, yeah, we get slightly more jitter. But on the whole, that's not too bad, I think. Obviously, we've still got this wire running right past the actual pot itself with its unshielded body, so that's a pretty good test. And don't forget, you should only be looking in the second column because that's the pot that's here, which is the one that I actually had the wire wrapped round. Of course, this one is attached to the joint, so as I'm moving that motor to drive more current, this is actually moving the leg and moving this pot, so of course this one is going to vary more, and it should do. So this is where people shout at the screen and say, of course the number's less jittery, all you've done is remove resolution, which is true, but it does give me an almost rock-solid number. If I had a more expensive pot and I shielded the body, perhaps we could get a really solid number that never changes. And that's quite useful, because if we're going to use that number to drive a pitch controller, which is essentially an amplifier, if we've got any jitter, that'll get amplified, but if there's no jitter, and the numbers rock solid, that means the output of our PID controller will be solid and our motor won't jitter, and there'll be no knock-on consequences like that. It's important to say though that the actual encoder doing position control on the O drive with the 8192 counts per revolution encoder is far higher resolution than even the 13-bit resolution on a pot for that whole envelope of travel, and that's because the 8192 encoder counts is the resolution per revolution of the motor that's then geared down roughly two to one on the ball screw and each revolution only moves the ball screw five millimeters. So that's a much better re resolution than we would get out of the pot. But there we go, that's sort of a cheap way to close the loop. We could use some higher um, resolution encoder on the actual joints, but of course that costs lots of money. So the way I've been using the O-Drive on OpenDog up to date is to do actual position control using this encoder. And that was the problem in the first place, because as we power this up, it gets a zero position from wherever this is when it powers up. And then we can't change that unless we home it. And then we basically get the Arduino to take that value away so it knows where its zero position is and feed subsequent positions to the O-Drive uh, taking into account that difference. And that's all been done on the Arduino to date. So now what we want to do is use this pot to actually get the joint position, drive the O-Drive in velocity mode instead of position mode. So we still use the encoder to decide how fast it goes and then use that as if we're driving a DC motor with PWM to get the right velocity so that we can close our loop using PID from the set point that we've got there and the input to the PID controller, which is there. So I've just used the Arduino PID library, which of course works as well on Teensy because we're programming as an Arduino. So you'll notice I've got quite a high gain here, and that's because we basically need to drive that O-Drive with encoder counts per second. And in fact, to get full speed on a 24 volt motor, we need to drive 4.8 million encoder counts per second. And if it were, if it were 48 volts and not 24, then that would need to be doubled to get full speed. So it's pretty quick as it is, uh, but obviously we need a high gain on our amplifier there. So all I'm doing, um, as well as the rest of the code here, which is the stock Arduino O-Drive example, is doing my PID parameters. The set point is pot two, which is the one I'm turning. The input is the one attached to the leg. Do a PID compute, and then um, as well as dumping some stuff out to the serial terminal, essentially we're doing an O-Drive set velocity for motor zero. We can drive either motor zero or one on the board, and we're using that output, which has a, a plus or minus swing. So if we now open up the serial monitor, we've got basically what the pots are and what the output should be, which is a very high number. And you'll notice any jitter on these pots causes quite a big jitter on this number because we're amplifying it so many times. Um, of course, if we did use a higher bit resolution on the analog pot, we wouldn't have to amplify it so much. So it probably comes to the same thing. But if these numbers were entirely stable, we'd have no jitter at all. And that would mean we got a very smooth motion and the motor would stay absolutely still when it gets to its position. So now we turn this whole thing into a servo and of course when I turn this pot it's going to give me a higher output on the motor to try and match it with this pot. So uh, this is running pretty much the full speed I can have on my 24 volt battery as I say I've had 48 volts and it's a 48 volt O-Drive we could go twice as quick. Um, we're still on 40 amps so pretty much the current limit as well. So that makes quite a satisfying servo just turning that. It tries to match the position. Obviously, if the distance is bigger, it's proportional, so it goes faster till it gets there. And the PID controller's not really tuned. There's no I or D values, but it's proportional, so it should slow down as it gets there and not overshoot. So that's good, but you can see we've still got quite a lot of uh, motor jitter here. And you can see that reflected in the serial monitor where that, well, the pot, one of the pots has got kind of like an extra one stuck on the end occasionally. And that's getting amplified up and it's causing the motor to jitter. So we could, of course, use motion filtering, which we've done in the past. We've got a little bit on open dog at the moment, uh, but obviously as we filter out these uh, things, it will filter out its reaction. That'll make it worse at balancing. So uh, 
this works okay, but I'm not sure this is um, absolutely the right answer. So now we're just running in position mode using the encoder and keeping that position control within the O drive to position the motor using the encoder. And I'm sending the commands over the serial terminal instead of the analog pots. So we've got no analog pots in the mix at all. So you'll see that um, it's extremely precise. And there's no motor jitter there. That's still obviously powered on with holding power. But the motor's held really well and it's using this encoder with all of those counts per revolution to position it. And when it's still, it's extremely stable. And that's how we're currently using the O drives in OpenDog at the moment. So what's the conclusion of all this? At the moment, obviously, we've got this very precise, accurate and stable position control of every joint using the O drive and using that encoder. And the test we've done basically involved putting analog pots everywhere with those analog wires. We'd need to get some quite good quality pots, not the ones I'm using. We might get a more stable answer, but we've still got quite a few issues there. Obviously, if any of the pots become disconnected or the Arduino becomes disconnected from the O drive, then the O drive is going to keep driving in velocity mode. It's not going to get any extra commands, and so it's not going to slow down and stop, and it'll overshoot its end stops and all of those things if we do it that way. Whereas if we actually have the O drive positioning it with the encoder, the closed loop control happens within the O drive. So even if the Arduino powers down or gets disconnected, the O drive moves the joint to its position and it stops and um, everything's good. So I'm inclined not to get rid of this incredibly precise stable position control that we have in the O drive, but I do need some other answer to um, calibrating on power up and not having to home the end switches. So what I'll be inclined to do is modify all the joints to fit the pots in, read them perhaps with a running average or some filtering on startup to get a good enough answer as to where the joints are when we power the dog on, and then go and take that number or translate that into the encoder count, take that number off to uh, work out what our current zero position is of the encoder count, and then carry on feeding those encoder position numbers to the O drive from then on. So then we could recover the dog in any position, uh, regardless of where its legs are, we'd know where it is, we could have some sort of startup process that can put the legs straight um, and put them all straight. We could have an inertial measurement unit in the body even, so it could work out what its total pose is, um, and that would be a much better solution. Also, obviously, if we do put pots on the joint, we're gonna end up measuring some of that mechanical slop that's quite bad that we've got there, um, which is gonna cause us even more issues, and the motor will constantly be trying to be compensating. Obviously, with the encoder attached to the motor, then as long as that thing stays stable, and I need to work on this bracket, um, then there shouldn't be any issues and the motor will position itself just as stably and any slop there won't be taken into account. There are some other mechanical improvements I need to make, um, especially this knee, which is basically a bolt for a piece of plastic. There are bearings on the outside, uh, but this is um, quite flexible and not very good. There's also some play in these rose joints. So to fix some of that, as well as rebuilding that knee and potentially putting the pot on, we've got some new rose joints. So these were sent as samples from Igus. Um, there's just exactly the right number for open dog though, which is good, and these are much tighter and are made of polymer, which was a bit lighter. But we're probably going to put that weight back on with the metal pulley upgrades that I've been waiting for for a while. Um, these are aluminium pulleys to replace the plastic ones on the motor and the ball screw, and these basically have two grub screws in each so they don't slip. Um, there's some problems with the plastic ones, I've just got a captive nut and they're plastic, so when we spin the motor really fast they slip on either the motor or the ball screw, so these are going to be the rock solid upgrades. Also we need to upgrade the encoder mounts as well as the bracket they're on on the actual dog. You'll notice what I've been doing is 3D printing a piece of plastic here and screwing some 8mm studding in with a bit of blue tape to make it the right size for the 8mm adapter for this encoder. Now that's the biggest size that the encoder comes with, the hole isn't big enough for anything else. There is actually an aluminium mount that goes on the back of these motors because they're drone motors. Unfortunately it's 10mm, so I've now got a lathe and we can turn those down a little bit then we should be able to fit the encoders properly on the proper metal mount. So obviously we haven't actually even powered the dog up in this video or made any modifications to it, but I need to go through that process of deciding what it is that happens next. So if you want to see more open dog videos on a regular basis, they're likely to be like this. We do have to do some mechanical updates, which we'll do in the next video. Um, I was going to do all of this in the background and make one roundup video, as I said at the start, and then hopefully we can show the dog doing something significant in each update video instead of actually nothing. But if you want to see more videos like this, then let me know in the comments below or support me on Patreon for a YouTube channel membership or by buying Open Dog t-shirts. Alright, that's all for now.